right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jared Lee. I'm the uh, RAL seminar coordinator. Um, and today, um, today our speaker is Joe Grimm uh, from here in RAL. Joe got his bachelor's degree in synoptic meteorology from Purdue University and both his master's and PhD in atmospheric sciences from the University of Illinois. Ever since, he's worked here at RAL, and in fact, in just two days, he'll be celebrating his 15th anniversary of working here at RAL, so congratulations. Um, his current projects in RAL are FAA convective weather, Wharf Hydro, and ATEC, and he's worked on many other projects over the years as well. And so to those of you who are online, um, uh, down below the, um, below the, the video uh, showing the live stream, there will be a, there's a Slido form where you can ask questions. So after the seminar, we'll be taking questions both from the in-person audience and also um, online as well. So Joe? Thanks for the introduction, Jared. And I, I want to start by th also thanking James Pinto, who uh, worked on this research with me and provided a lot of great insight. So to introduce the study, I want to uh, point out that the results described here are from the summer 2022 HER version, version 4, and the experimental version of RUFUS. And they don't represent necessarily the current experimental performance of RUFUS nor the operational version that's expected to be ready in 2024. Uh, our motivation for this FAA-funded study is to provide insight into model performance for aviation interests, uh, such as convection avoidance, icing turbulence, ceiling height, and also to provide feedback to model developers. So uh, for any of you model developers in the audience, I would definitely appreciate uh, some of your insight as well, because um, we want to see what, what you think. So I'm going to start by giving a product description. We use three different products. One is the multi-rater, multi-sensor, or MRMS observations. And those come from composite reflectivity. And the composite reflectivity primarily comes from WSR 88D radars, and also some other radars like terminal Doppler radars. And they provide coverage over the United States and Canada. Uh, we have two model products. One is the high resolution rapid refresh, or HER, and we're using version four of that, which was released in December 2020. Uh, it's an operational short-term forecast model with a wharf dynamical core. It's three kilometer convection allowing, hourly updating, and it uses indirect radar assimilation. It has 18 hour forecast every hour, except for every sixth hour, it has 48 hour forecast in the data is provided by NCEP. And the second model we're looking at is the Rapid Refresh Forecast System, or RUFUS model. It's also, uh, it's uh, experimental with an FV3 dynamical core, and it's planned to replace HER in 2024. It's also three kilometer convection allowing and hourly updating, and it uses direct radar assimilation with 15 hour forecasts every hour and the experimental data was provided to us by NOAA GSL. So the, this here is a set of three plots showing the availability of the different products that we had uh, over summer 2022. Uh, at the top is MRMS, and I have it shaded by whether it was available or not. On the x-axis is the day of the summer, and on the y-axis, is the hour of the day. So you can see other than about eight pixels or so, we had the entire summer available. Uh, for the two model products in the middle and the bottom, instead of just showing whether it was available zero or, I mean one or not available zero, I have it shaded uh, based on what percentage of the 15 hour forecast was available at each gen time. So each pixel stands for a gen time and it's shaded through uh, the colors from zero, uh, white to yellow to orange to red, depending on how much availability there was. So you can see Rufus uh, definitely had some missing days since it was an experimental model. And um, there was also more missing times between roughly 22Z and 08Z. You can see 
more of those white spots in, in those areas. And then the HER model was uh, available from our data feed throughout almost the entire summer other than one day in early June and then a few uh, forecast hours late in the month of August. So we initially chose about 80 cases from last summer to investigate widespread, the, the model's ability to predict widespread convection. And based on model availability, we had to narrow those down to 32 cases when we actually had all three products available. And we chose them to, so that there'd be eight cases, each from four different mature convective modes. And by mature convective mode, I mean the most mature uh, that system developed into uh, over the course of its lifetime. So the most mature uh, in our classification was MCSs, where you have a convective line with a substantial trailing stratiform region, or uh, one in front as well as possible. Uh, QLCSs are similar, they're a convective line but without much stratiform rain region. Uh, clusters are cells that merge but not into a highly formed uh, system like you would with a QLCS or MCS. And then cellular were those systems that convection just re largely remained uh, cellular throughout. And some of these systems that we're gonna look at, um, they started out as cellular, then they moved to clusters, and then, for example, to MCSs. So in such a situation, we would classify that as an MCS. And uh, you can see examples of each of the categories here on the left. Here is a plot showing the availability of all three products at each model gen time. So it looks very similar to the previous one, except it's looking at all three simultaneously. And the selected uh, gen times are in those black boxes that you see. And so uh, most of the start times were during the daytime, although most of the uh, um, cases that occurred during the night were MCS, as you can see there I labeled four of the five nighttime initiation cases were MCSs. Okay, this next plot is, it has a lot of information on it, so I'm gonna just slowly go through it and describe what, what we see. So first of all, this is a frequency of composite reflectivity for the entire summer last year. And I'm showing on here MRMS with the black line and then each of the model products at each forecast hour with colors of the rainbow with short dashed lines indicating um, Rufus and long dashed lines indicating her. So on the x-axis is the composite reflectivity bin. Each bin is one dBZ wide. And on the y-axis is the mean aerial coverage in kilometers squared. So it's essentially in each histogram bin, how much aerial coverage at that bin, in that bin are we seeing? So on the left-hand side of the MRMS plot, you can see that we don't really have that much uh, aerial coverage at low reflectivity values. And that's mostly just because of clutter being removed from MRMS at low dBZ values. It's not because we don't have light precipitation there. It's, it's um, just difficult to discern it from uh, other scatterers in the atmosphere. And then you can see after it spikes up around 12 dBZ, then it, it's got a, a smooth curve that, well, mostly smooth curve that goes down so that by 70 dBZ, we see very few uh, reflectivity values at that high of level. Uh, for the Rufus model, the, the top set of uh, short dashed lines that you can see, um, it has uh, high coverage at low reflectivity values, and then you can see it follows the same general decreasing pattern with increasing reflectivity um, until that it actually uh, has lower aerial coverage between roughly 10 dBZ and 35 dBZ than uh, what the MRMS has. And at that point, it has higher aerial coverage. So essentially, we're seeing more high reflectivity values from Rufus. And uh, there's a similar pattern for her, except it's a little bit lower. You can see the, 
the long colored dashed lines are, are lower. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out on this plot is that um, you can see the early forecast hours, so that, you know the more red colors on the plot, um, those have lower aerial coverage. And then with each forecast hour going forward, you can see there's more aerial coverage. And then it kind of reaches a, a point where it asymptotes. And from roughly forecast hour eight onward, the lines are pretty much on top of each other. And you see a similar pattern uh, for her, except they're spread out a little bit more uh, with time. So we needed, we the whole reason for making this plot was to choose a um, reflectivity threshold to identify convection. So in previous studies, we've used 35 dBZ, um, but we just wanted to make sure that that was the, the correct one to use here. And so we looked at where the, the lines cross over and um, wanted to see where are the frequencies roughly the same. So for Rufus, um, all the Rufus lines pretty much intersect the MRMS line at 36 dBZ. And for her, the frequencies intersect between 37 to 40 dBZ, depending on the forecast hour. There's one last thing I want to point out about this plot, and that is the, the analysis time, so that the darkest red colors. And so if we look here, you can see this dark red long dash line for her at forecast hour zero. It, it definitely stands out from the rest of the forecast hours. And that's the result of um, data assimilation of radar data. And it's just for some reason between roughly 18 dBZ and 32 dBZ, we see a lot higher frequency as the radar data assimilation um, shows higher uh, convective coverage area. And then we see a, a, a similar thing for Rufus, except it's at a higher set of dBZ uh, values and it's got more of a uh, Gaussian shaped uh, line to it. And since uh, Rufus uses a different data assimilation technique for radar data, I guess it's not surprising um, that this happens, but it would be interesting to uh, hear from some of you who work with models to see what your interpretation of, of exactly what's happening here is. So I'm gonna get a quick sip of water. This is an example case that I'm gonna show. It's uh, from an MCS in mid-July. Um, it started out as just residual weak convection from a uh, previous day's uh, storm system. And that, that's how a lot of our cases storm is. It, it, the storm hadn't 100% died out, it just mostly died out. And then um, after that point, we got some scattered convective clusters that developed for several hours. And then you can see here, uh, once it loops through again, you'll be able to see a QLCS uh, form on the north side right there. And then at the same time that happened, there were some clusters converging on the south side over Iowa and Illinois, Missouri. And those eventually all converged into a uh, strengthening MCS. And then a few hours later, the MCS started to gradually weaken. The next uh, slide here shows uh, the same thing except for all three uh, products simultaneously. So MRMS is on the left that you've already seen, HER is in the middle, and Rufus is on the right. And I'll, I'll point out um, in this talk, generally when I'm referring to HER, I'm gonna use red highlights. So you can see the red HER on the bottom there, and I'm gonna use blue highlights to refer to Rufus, and that's just um, to kind of uh, differentiate between them more clearly. So you can see for her in this case, uh, it had a very similar evolution to what was observed. We had um, weak convection early, and then a QLCS formed, and it all converged into an MCS. It was a little bit delayed compared to MRMS, but uh, the same general pattern in the same general areas is what happened. Uh, Rufus, on the other hand, couldn't quite get a QLCS going. It looked like it was trying to on the north side, but it just never happened. Uh, but it also followed a similar pattern. So in order to uh, objectively define storm area, storm counts, things like that, we used 
uh, the Titan software, which stands for Thunderstorm Identification Tracking Analysis and Nowcasting. And we use that to identify areas of pickle, pixels within each Titan object. So the Titan objects on this plot here are outlined in red, and then the pixels that we measure the area of are in blue that you can see there. And so to get the number of objects, we just counted the number of, of red Titan objects, and that's the number of storms. And then to calculate the mean storm size, we just take the total storm area divided by the total storm count, and that's how we get the mean storm size. So how do we compare storms between MRMS, HER, and RUFUS, even if they don't overlap? So one way that a lot of studies do is, you know, you, you um, try to see where storms are overlapping, and then you calculate statistics based on that. But we wanted to see not necessarily whether we got radar pixels in exactly the right spot, but rather if we got it in the correct general area, and you know even if there's a, a bit of an offset. And so to do that, I plotted uh, for every case a the time evolution of MRMS pixels greater than 35 dBZ in gray. And then the same thing for Rufus during the entire evolution of the system in blue. And then the same thing for her. And then using Google Earth, I just outlined the area of all of the, the pixels to make sure we got you know, everything from MRMS and everything for Rufus and everything for her within the same uh, polygon. And then we measured the storm area and the storm count within those polygons. And so here's a plot on the left of all of the polygons from the entire storm uh, summer, uh, all 32 storms, and they're colored by the date. But uh, that looks probably kind of like a pretty noisy plot to you all. So instead, I created a new plot on the right that shows how many storms were over every single place in the country. And you can see over the eastern two-thirds of the country, which is what we focused on in this study because we have better radar coverage in those areas, uh, as well as far southern, uh, southeastern Canada, you can see that we had generally between zero and 14 storms. And we tried to focus on an area called the Golden Triangle, which is between the airports of Atlanta, New York City, and Chicago because that's of a lot of aviation interest. And you can see a lot of these uh, widespread convective cases fell into that area. The next thing we wanted to look at were, was how do the storm sizes compare with the summer as a whole? You know, we don't want to pick out 32 cases and they're not representative of the rest of the summer. So we created um, a PDF of the 32 cases of the storm area histogram on the x-axis and the percentage of storms in each storm area bin on the y-axis. And we used uh, logarithmic scales for both in order to um, really fit it into one plot well. And so you can see they both have a very similar size distribution. Uh, there's slightly fewer small storms um, from the 32 cases uh, as a percentage and slightly more medium and especially large storms. And that was just by design. We we're focusing more on widespread convection as opposed to isolated convection, so you'd expect there to be a few more medium and large storms. And so the next thing I wanted to do was show uh, what the Titan objects look like in a time series where you can see on the left-hand side is the actual radar reflectivity. On the right-hand side is what the Titan objects look like. And you can see that uh, Essentially, on the left-hand side, wherever you see colors in the uh, yellowish green or higher is where the, you can see the blue on the right-hand side. And the same thing was done for the two model products. So for this analysis, we're going to be focusing on what I'm going to refer to as event hours. So there are a number of hours since the event started. And for the models, since we had those um, model analysis times forecast hour zero, where there was just the higher reflectivity, we're gonna leave the analysis times out of the um, results that we show here. So 
essentially what event hour zero is uh, for most of this talk today is going to be model forecast hour one. And it's going to go all the way out until the end of the Rufus forecast at the 15 hour forecast, which is event hour 14. And so this is the, the time period that we're covering, the, what's shown in the red arrow here. So to show you um, an ex example for the 15 July case where we look at total storm area, um, that's what's on the y-axis and then the, the time since the event hour zero is on the x-axis. So if you look at the black line here for MRMS, you can see that the total storm area just barely was increasing for the first several hours. And then around 6Z, it started to increase rapidly and reached a peak around 12Z. Uh, the, the two models um, had a similar pattern, except it was delayed by about an hour or two. You can see uh, very little development in total storm area until you get to around 8Z. And then you can see both models total storm area coverage increases rapidly so that it actually uh, is higher than what MRMS showed. And you can see that they reached their peak aerial coverage about one hour late. And then all three of them uh, weakened thereafter. So the next plot is for total storm count. So just the number of storms, regardless of their size. And so for MRMS, you can see that the total storm count uh, started to gradually increase right from the earliest time. It's a little bit noisy as some cells are merging while others are splitting, but it's a general increasing pattern until about 10Z, a little bit earlier than what we saw for the peak in the total storm area. And then it generally decreases after that point. Um, for her, you can see in the red line here, we just had very gradual increase until about 9Z, and then you can see a sharp increase in the total number of storm objects. And it peaks a little bit late, about an hour late, and then gradually decreases after that. Um, Rufus, on the other hand, has practically no increase in storm objects until suddenly, within a couple hours, it goes from 20 storms to 90 storms. And it peaks a little bit early, about an hour early, uh, and then generally decreases after that. So for the third and final plot in this series, it's mean storm area. So total storm area divided by total storm count. And so what we saw in those previous two plots is going to be reflected in this. Uh, MRMS has a gradual increase in storm size until about 14Z. Uh, her, on the other hand, has a a, uh, a bit of a stronger increase at a higher mean storm area until about 15Z. And it uh, was about an hour too late. And the storms were just uh, slightly too large, you know, about 25% too large. And then Rufus, on the other hand, had a slightly more gradual increase in storm size than her did, uh, and then peaked between 13 to 15 Z, you can see that double peak in the blue line. And uh, the mean size was not as biased for this example case than her. So instead of just showing 32 plots, sets of plots like I just showed, what we wanted to do was to calculate a composite of each statistic, statistic across all three, 32 cases. So what we did was we normalized every single plot that we uh, had so that the maximum observed value would be one. And then every other hour compared to that for the observations would be some fraction of one. And I'll, I'll show you a good example of this on the next slide. And we did the same thing for the, each of the two models. We compared them to the maximum observed value. And then in order to normalize them, we just, uh, for every single event hour, we summed all of their values and divided by the total number of cases. And that's how we got the normalized total storm area and the normalized total storm count. Uh, we also tried calculating a normalized uh, mean storm area. Uh, that was a bit noisy just because we have a few uh, cases with um, just a few 
individual storms very early or very late and made it a noisy plot. So to make a, a plot that was easier to interpret, we instead calculated what we call normalized total storm, uh, storm area ratio, which is just a ratio of normalized total storm area to normalized total storm count. So this is the same plot you saw a couple of slides back. On the, the y-axis is the total storm area, and then when we normalize it, you can see this little green dashed arrow going to the right, and that would be a value of one for the um, maximum observed, and then everything else is compared to that. So for example, you can see that the red her line here is about 20% higher than what the, when it at its peak, compared to the M black MRMS line. And the Rufus line peaked about 40% higher. And then we just averaged these for all 32 cases uh, to create this next plot. So this shows uh, in the black line again, MRMS, you can see that uh, averaged across all the cases, it has increasing total storm area until about 7Z and then gradually decreases thereafter. Uh, Rufus, you can see, has uh, a pretty strong positive bias. It uh, ends up biasing about 50% too high and about an hour too fast. You can see the peak here is just a little bit early. Uh, her, on the other hand, is only biased about 5% high. You can see its peak is only 5% higher, but it, on the other hand, is about an hour too slow compared to MRMS. The next plot is total storm count, and it was made in the exact same way as a previous plot, except with storm counts. Uh, the, the shapes, again, are, are similar. You can see that same, you know, gradual increase kind of uh, has a, a peak that is a rounded hilltop and then decreases thereafter. Uh, in this case, Rufus was biased a little bit low. Uh, but not as much as her. So Rufus was only about 10% too few storms uh, and was about an hour too slow. Her, on the other, other hand, was about 20% too few storms and about two hours too slow until it, it reached its peak. And then the normalized storm area ratio plot, which shows the ratio of the previous two plots, um, it shows a, a bit of a different shape. Uh, both models definitely over predict the storm area ratio. Uh, Rufus peaks about 60% too large and has a, a bit more of a complicated timing than MRMS. You can see the double peak there. Uh, her, on the other hand, predicted storms that were roughly 30% too large and about an hour too slow. So the next thing we wanted to look at is how are these statistics uh, what do they look like when we look at individual storm types based on their mature stages? And so for the MCS storms, in other words, all the storms that ended up turning into an MCS, um, you can see that the three colored lines are overlapping each other pretty well. Um, both of them peak a little bit lower than what the obser observations were, and you can see a little bit more of a, a time delay in the red her line compared to the blue Rufus line, but they're, they're relatively close together. But as we get to uh, less organized convective systems like QLCSs in the upper right or clusters in the lower left, you can see that the lines spread apart a bit more. Um, in each of these, uh, Rufus ha has a more positive bias than her, um, but they're not nearly as pronounced as in the lower right hand panel, you can see the cellular plot where Rufus is over twice as much um, total storm area compared to what the MRMS observation showed, whereas her was just slightly too high um, and her was delayed about uh, two hours uh, late. I'm going to get another sip. So for normalized total storm count based on mature convective mode, um, we can see that there was similar low biases for all the different storm modes. Uh, mostly at the earlier times, the lines get a bit closer together uh, near, near to the peaks. 
um, and later times, except for cellular. Cellular, again, is where we see the biggest difference um, with the Rufus model uh, producing uh, total storm counts that are a bit closer to reality compared to her. And the Rufus timing was a little bit better than her was for cellular. The last uh, comparison between these different storm types is for normalized storm area ratio. And again, we saw the least biases for the more organized convective modes, such as MCSs, with a bit more spreading apart of the uh, values for QLCSs and clusters. And by the time you get to cellular, the smallest storm uh, organization, you can see that Rufus is a factor of 2.5 higher than her at, at some, I mean, than MRMS at some times, uh, with her being about 70% too large. So uh, a question we asked ourselves is, you know, are these results applicable everywhere, you know, for different reflectivity thresholds? Because, you know, we're using 35 dBZ, but 35 dBZ encompasses um, often a significant portion of trailing stratiform regions. So we decided to see how using a higher threshold, such as 40 dBZ, affected the results. And so this is just an example at the mature stage of the same example case that you've looked at so far. Um, and you can see there's a lot less storm area at the 40 dBZ threshold. So for the next series of plots, I'm gonna be mostly comparing how using this higher threshold changes the results as opposed to um, how we would interpret those individually, just because they pretty much show the same thing as a 35 dBZ threshold, except it tends to amplify the differences. So you can see here on the right-hand side, the biases for both her and Rufus are, are magnified using the 40 dBZ threshold instead of 35 dBZ. And the times of the peaks for each of the products is a little bit earlier. Um, for normalized total storm count, we can see that on the right-hand side now, the, the black MRMS line and the blue Rufus line are almost overlaid on top of each other. There's um, a lot of similarity to them without much um, bias. A little bit difference in, in timing, but other than that, it's, it's very, very similar. And for her, we have just a little bit fewer uh, total storm counts, but it's closer to what the MRMS values are th throughout most of the event hours. Next is the normalized storm area ratio. And again, the, the biases are magnified um, nearly twice as much uh, for the two models compared to MRMS as what they were using the 35 dBZ threshold. And the storm size is maximized just a little bit earlier. So up until this point, I've been showing all results using a gen time that starts one hour before the event started. But we wanted to see what are the, how, how would the results look like if we used other gen times? What if we look back at two hours before the storm uh, began or three hours or up to you know six hours before? And how are, are the results gonna look like if we look further and forward in time so that we're incorporating storms that already exist? So um, on the bottom of this line plot, you can see the gen time relative to the event start time. And we, this green zero and negative one and the little hash in the middle uh, indicates what we've been using so far. But what I wanna do is go back five hours before that and five hours uh, after that. And so in the following plots, I'm gonna be looking at what I'm gonna call model lag hours. And that's just whether it's five hours earlier than what we've been using so far, all the way through five hours later. And because we're looking at 11 different gen times for each case, uh, we had a lot less availability of the different cases. So we, we could only use 13 of the 32 cases that had sufficient availability um, 
in order to be included in statistics. And what we determined to be sufficient availability was at most one forecast hour missing. Uh, and so having only 13 cases mean we only had four MCSs, two QLCSs, four clusters, and three cellular. So at least we have them spread out apart across the different categories relatively well. So here's the normalized total storm area plot. And instead of using the black, blue, and red lines like I showed before, uh, in order to differentiate between them, I'm using a solid black line for MRMS, a um, long dash line for her, and a short dash line for Rufus. And then the, the model lags are uh, colored through the colors of the rainbow, going from red through green all the way to purple. And um, first of all, we, we saw a very similar pattern in, in these plots to what we saw in the earlier plots where we looked at total storm area. So what I really want to focus on is how does model lag time affect the results. And so in order to do that, it, I want you to focus first on just the, the Rufus, the short dash lines here. And you can see that the reds and orange lines it, it peaks higher at higher values, whereas if we get down towards the uh, yellows and the greens, you can see that the lines peak a little bit lower. And then especially when we get to uh, model lag hours of two to three, um, then we can see that the, the magnitude of the bias above the black MRMS line is less. And then as you get to the very last um, model lag hours, you can see th this purple line, it moves back up again. And we see a, a very similar pattern uh, from the HER model, this long dash lines, where early on, I mean, for the earlier model lags, we have um, higher values. And then by the time you get to model lag zero, you can see the green line here is very near to the MRMS line. And then when you get to the, the dark blue and purple, you can see it increasing again. And so even though they didn't have the exact um, same timing of the minimum and bias, they were in the same general area uh, between negative one to positive three it, for the HER and between positive two and positive four for Rufus. So in order to show this a little bit more clearly than just looking at a whole bunch of dashed lines on a plot, I'm gonna look at just event hour seven. And I'm gonna show the exact same data that's on this plot, but only at event hour seven. So now we have on the x-axis, the model gen lag uh, ranging from negative five to positive five. And then uh, on the y-axis is the normalized total storm area. And then we just have a single value for MRMS. So I just draw, drew a straight line to indicate the single MRMS value at about 0.72. And then you can see the uh, red HER line here. It uh, has a higher bias for the uh, earlier model gen lags. And then as you get to around negative one to positive three, you can see it's very nearly the same as what the MRMS value was. Uh, Rufus on the other time was biased high no matter what gen lag we used, but you can see it had a general minimum um, around positive three hour lag. And so this uh, suggested to us maybe that uh, the optimal model gen times were when uh, the system was about to initiate or had just started to initiate um, by a few hours. And we're wondering, could this be uh, indicative of differences in how the radar reflectivity is assimilated between the models using the data assimilation. And um, again, for those of you who are model experts, we would really appreciate your feedback on that. Uh, here's the exact same type of plot shown except for normalized total storm count. And um, as we discussed before, both models underpredict the number of storms at most lags and event hours. Uh, there's too much area in the previous plot. 
Uh, so with too few storms here, we're gonna make individual storms that are too big. The her counts were lower than Rufus, the, the long dash lines compared to the short dash lines, but this bias is smaller for runs initialized several hours prior to the event initiation, whereas runs initialized after convective initiation tended to perform worst. Um, for Rufus, the counts were generally better than her, uh, especially at forecast hour one. If you look here um, with each uh, model lag that's greater than zero, you can see the uh, the short dash lines start pretty much right at where the uh, observed line was. And then they kind of diverge from there um, away from the MRMS line. So uh, the, the final plot I wanted to show is normalized storm area ratio. Uh, it's a bit too noisy to really pull out a lot of information on the effect of lag. Um, Regardless, the, the storm area ratio in both models was a bit too large after the initialization time, and the Rufus storm sizes were generally larger than her regardless. And the storm area, uh, storm ratio bins um, initialized before convective initiation were indi indistinguishable from bias of runs initialized after CI for both Rufus and her. So the final analysis I wanted to show today is a, um, from a later version of the experimental Rufus run in December 2022. And it was during this time they reran 17 days of the summer between 20 July and 5 August. And during that time period, we had six cases that we had already worked with, um, two MCSs, two cellular, and one each of QLCSs and uh, clusters. So for the next set of analyses, I'm only gonna show results for these six cases, and I'm gonna use four lines. The same colored lines as we used before, except blue now indicates the summer 22 version, and purple indicates the December 22, 2022 version. And I'll mainly focus on just comparing the two Rufus versions as opposed to comparing her. And uh, one other thing I should point out is that we're just only looking at these six cases, not the entire summer, just the six cases. So you can see for the normalized total storm area, the purple line for the Rufus retro run is a little bit lower, a little bit lower uh, bias than what we saw for the uh, original Rufus run. But then when we look at normalized total storm count in the middle, we can see that we now have an even stronger uh, negative bias in the uh, total storm counts, like about 15% worse. And for the normalized individual storm ratio on the right-hand side, we see um, a kind of a mixed bag here. The, the blue and the purple lines are pretty much overlapping each other early on in the event. And then you can see that the Rufus retro is a little bit worse during the the middle hours of the event, and then is a little bit better at the end. So uh, I first, for the conclusions, I wanna start out with the major conclusions and then uh, next have implications. So the major conclusions that we saw here were that we there were similar size distributions between 32 cases, meaning that it was representative of the summer as a whole. Um, next, I, I created a uh, table that you can see below to see which model performed better for which category. And we had three primary categories, total storm area, total storm count, and storm area ratio. And then we, we're gonna look at the magnitude and the timing of each. And so for her, uh, it did best at the total storm area magnitude, especially for the cellular category. It also performed better for storm area ratio, both magnitude and timing, and especially for the magnitude with the uh, cellular category. For Rufus, the performance was better for total storm area timing, as well as total storm count magnitude and timing. So the model analysis lags um, that we looked at in the second to last set of uh, slides were most accurate near the storm initiation time 
and shortly thereafter. Uh, Rufus Retro Runs um, made slight changes in some categories. It was slightly improved. Some uh, cases it was slightly worse. Uh, maybe the sample size was too small since we're only looking at six cases. So um, we, we can't really read too much on, into those results. Uh, the, the last slide here is m implications for model development and interpretation. And so we saw that the models over predicted the size of small individual storms. That's what we saw a lot with those uh, cellular storms. And, and it's quite possible that the three kilometer grid spacing is just insufficient to resolve um, these really small storms. Uh, it could be also the effect of differences in horizontal diffusion. Uh, could affect storm counts and size biases. Uh, the models assimilated radar differently. Her uh, does it indirectly, whereas Rufus does it more directly. And the impact of these differences was evident in the evolution of convection in Rufus and Her. And we noticed that, uh, differences in distributions of composite reflectivity frequency at the analysis time. That's that uh, plot I showed early on with the uh, where the uh, analysis time really st stood up above the rest of the uh, plot. Uh, storm counts early in forecast uh, after the convection formed. And then also the evolution in storm counts after the analysis time, where the Rufus counts decreased with lead time, whereas her did not. And uh, maybe this is what contributed to that extra one hour her lag that we saw in several of the plots. but. Uh, more importantly, I would like to get uh, your thoughts and feedback and what you saw here and, uh, and get your questions. So thank you very much for your time. So uh, does anyone have questions for Joe? Yeah, that was a great talk. Um, so I'm wondering, given that there's some uh, overestimation of storm area by the models or compared to uh, MRMS, um, do you think the gaps in MRMS due to uh, radar beams being uh, um, at certain heights compared to the multiple layers that you can get through a model, do you think that contributes to the overestimation of um, storm area from a uh, model's perspective? I, I'm sure it, it contributes to a certain extent, but uh, especially for the, the small cellular size storms, um, the, the, the fact that Rufus was twice as much as what we saw with MRMS, it, it likely was other things as well. Thanks. Any other questions in the room right now? Or on Slido? Or, or <laughs> nothing online yet. Um, yeah, I mean, this is definitely a hot topic of which, you know, you know, her her versus Rufus, which is which is better. And I think it's pretty clear that there that um, that there's a lot of struggling going on in representing uh, in, in representing convection. Um, was it your in in looking at the the radar reflectivities, radar reflectivity loops of from, uh, you know, MRMS and then also her, her and Rufus. Did it seem to, like maybe even subjectively to your eye that one model seemed to be performing better? Because in the in the example that you showed at the um, early on, it seemed like her again from a somewhat subjective. I test it seemed like her was a lot better than than Rufus. Um, so I guess yeah. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah. So um, the, the 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 biggest problem that I noticed just looking at lots of radar reflectivity loops is that Rufus just created these what I will call hot bullseyes of convection, and I think that's what made its its values, especially of uh, this total storm area and and uh, uh, mean storm area ratio so high, is just that we had these big bulls, uh, not big, these strong bullseyes of um, high reflectivity values. And then when you 
uh, pull away from that, uh, there seem to be pretty similar uh, evolutions between the two products with Rufus tending to get a little bit better timing than her, even though her got the magnitude of the storm area better. So I, I guess another question is what are, what are the uh, what are the differences in even physics? I mean, because there, there are differences in the data simulation schemes, but what are the differences in some of the the physics parameterizations between the two models? Do they are, are they mostly the same? Or because I'm I'm pretty unfamiliar with the experimental Rufus configuration. Um, just what are the what are some of the other key differences between it and her? Yeah, and and that I'm I'm not actually entirely. Uh, I don't know as much as a lot of model developers do. So I, I tried to focus on the primary differences um, in one of the early slides. And so those are the primary ones that I know of, but I, I'm sure there's a few others. Um, and if anybody uh, that's a model developer knows, you know, you can feel free to, um, oh, physics are the same, okay. <laughs> that's good that James, uh, and uh, so. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Um, you did talk a little bit about this, but I was wondering if you were going to look any more into the higher reflectivity threshold of 40 versus 35, especially because it looked like the areas went down by maybe like 50% mm -hmm. and, and you got rid of a lot of the, maybe what you didn't want with the stratiform area. Yeah, and we tried looking at, uh, other thresholds as well. Um, I just, in the interest of time, I focused on 35 and 40. We actually even did a frequency matching, so that way we had the same number of pixels um, for MRMS as we had for Rufus for the entire summer um, for the, the aerial coverage of each. And um, it, it showed similar patterns uh, in timing, but the, the main difference was in the magnitude of the biases, how uh, much more storm area we had or how much fewer uh, storms we had. They were just the same no matter what threshold? Uh, no, they, if we used a higher reflectivity threshold, then Rufus was uh, biased higher. So it, like if we used even 50 dBZ, it would, Rufus was even biased higher because they had those really um, hot bullseyes for the convective cores. Oh, we got one more question in the back. Uh, maybe a naive question, but um, seeing that this is funded by FAA, would it not make more sense to look at convective cloud top height? Uh, that, that's an imp another important area to look at. And uh, if we can get uh, funding to do more of this work, that would be you know, a great thing to do is to do a similar type analysis, but looking at cloud top heights. Thanks for that idea. So have you, how, how much have you been sharing this information with NOAA? And if so, and, and if you have been sharing it, what feedback or reactions do they have? Uh, so we've sh uh, shared a bit of it um, and we've, we've been trying to get feedback on it, but they're, I, I think they're just really busy trying to uh, develop the model. Uh, we provided a, re a final report to them a couple weeks ago, and we've heard back from one person so far, and so we'll be discussing the results with her here pretty soon. Okay. Do you have still no, question, no additional questions online? All right, well, I think, um, yeah, and just, you know, Joe's obviously here. So um, I encourage you all, if you have, uh, if you have additional questions or, or additional ideas pop up, whoop, stand by, question coming in online. All right, from Andy Newman. Did you consider using MET mode for your analysis? How much uncertainty do you think there is across spatial analysis algorithms? Also, what is the conversion from model hydrometeors to reflectivity? Is that appropriate to directly compare to observations? Okay, so a lot of good questions there. 
Uh, we didn't use MEP mode for the analysis. We uh, used the same technique that we'd used for, the, uh, for two previous studies where we did similar things. Uh, how much uncertainty, uncertainty do I think there is across spatial analysis algorithms? Um, there, there's definitely a, a, a decent amount of uncertainty. We didn't actually quantify it. Um, and then using the conversion from model hydrometers to reflectivity, the, the two models used the same uh, conversion between the two, but you know that is another good point um, that composite reflectivity is calculated, or reflectivity in general is calculated a bit differently in the model than what we get from uh, observations from radar. So is it appropriate to compare directly to observations? Uh, yes, as long as we do it as, as uh, kind of as uh, skilled as, as we can, so. <laughs> And then a comment from Michelle Harold saying, um, there are several other folks in RAL working on verifying Rufus prototypes, and it would be great to coordinate. Nice representation. Thanks, Michelle. And yeah, I, that would be great to coordinate too. And if anybody wants to uh, um, email me, my email is grim at ucar.edu. That's G-R-I-M, just one M. And then James says, Andy, we're not matching object to object. Oh yeah, that's why we didn't use MET mode. So thanks, James, for mentioning that reason. I guess following up on that, um, do you have any plans to look into MET mode or to, to using mode uh, to just see, it, looking at a more object to object verification as a, as a complement to what you've already done? Um, I guess w what additional information do you think that that might give you? I think that would give some good information on whether we get the the locations correctly. Because, I mean, so the example I showed there for the 15 July MCS, that was uh, that the st storm areas were pretty much overlapping each other. But some of them, you know, they were offset by, you know, 50 to 100 kilometers. So, you know, by using something like MET mode or or Titan can can do this to a certain extent as well. Um, we could see how the uh, forecasts of offset um, would be affected. And I think it might be interesting also to see just how, you know, especially for the, the MRMS, to, to see how Titan identifies objects versus how Mode identifies objects, because I think that mm -hmm. might get to some of Andy's question earlier of how much uncertainty is there just in the difference between different spatial algorithms for, for object identification. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know enough about the difference between the two to really weigh in on that. Okay. We got a question from oh. Tom in the back if we have time. Well, you, I don't think you'd change the parameters for Titan internally. It's just, you know, different distributions and then you have comparison also. That would be interesting to see how it changes. So, so Tom suggested just changing the parameters for Titan internally. Um, Sorry, are you referring to like in the pre-compiled version or is, is there a way you can do that with a Titan param file? I was thinking about talking to Mike directly about it. Okay. Okay, and he's wow. suggesting that I talk to the developer, Mike Dixon, about it. Thanks. Okay. Well, one more, oh, one more pending. <laughs> All right, and we'll make this the final question um, from Chris Rosoff. Is anyone doing a similar comparison as you did between her and Rufus using satellite data instead of radar? Hmm. I, I'm not aware of it, but I bet you somebody somewhere is. But it would be if somebody here in NCAR or somebody watching is doing that, it would be great to talk with you. Yeah, I think yeah, trying to coordinate and, and be more aware of all of these. Um, all of these model comparison studies, you know, especially with just, I think, I think with there being some at least rumored uncertainty of kind of what is the future, what is the future of FE3, particularly at these convection permitting uh, scales uh, and just, you know, some concerns about, about performance. I think trying to, yeah, to the extent that we can, harmonizing and coordinating our, our comparison efforts, I think would be a, a great service for the community mm -hmm. as a whole. 
Yeah, I agree. Thanks for so. the that. All right. Well, let's let's thank Joe one more time.